All right, folks, I just got word that we've had a security incident, and that means we need to jump into action, and we need to do something about it. We need to contain it, we need to mitigate it, and then we need to recover the CMR. So let's jump in and talk about those three things. So starting off, we're containing the incident or the outbreak. So that means we need to isolate the infected hosts and or applications. So how do we do that? Well, we throw them in jail. <laughs> well, not exactly, but kind of, because what we need to do specifically when we're talking about hosts, we're talking about workstations uh, here, we're talking about servers, uh, no matter what it might be as far as a device, we need to isolate it, meaning pull it off the network. Because if we get it off the network, we can prevent that infection from spreading. So how do we do that? Well, we go into our device and we disable the network adapters in that device. So that means wired. And if there are wireless adapters in that device, we need to disable those as well. And then I would go ahead and unplug it as well from the ethernet port. Go ahead and unplug the ethernet cable uh, just to be safe. And that way we not only are disconnected physically, but logically by disabling our network adapters. But what if I'm running in a virtualized environment? I've got VM and one of the VMs is infected. Well, you can disable the network adapter from within the VM itself, just like we do in a physical host. And then you can use a virtual console to actually gain access into that host and manage it and work with it to figure out what's going on on that host. So that is how we contain or isolate infected hosts. Now, as we're talking about containment, we just talked about doing some physical work, physical containment. Well, there are tools out there called SOAR, and that's Security Orchestration Automation and Response. And this is a way to automate our incident response, or IR. And the way we do this, these are systems that plug into our networks and our other systems and can run commands and make changes in our environment. For example, if an incident occurs and our source system is identified and we have an infection, well, it can actually go into our network switches and it can disable a port where an infected host is plugged into. So that actually disconnects that infected host from the network which is a good thing, and it can automate that response. It could also automate a kickoff of an antivirus, anti-malware, anti-whatever you have, uh, endpoint security installed on your devices, so it starts that scan as well. And the way we do these is we generally use something called a playbook that we've talked about before. And remember, a playbook is a guide, basically a step-by-step -step guide, step-by-step, -step on how to respond to an incident. So we can follow these steps and get through the incident. Well, the thing is, I can use this playbook and program the source system to use this playbook or these steps in the playbook to respond just like a person would and perform much of this in an automated fashion that will happen much faster than if a person were doing it. And that is containment. Well, then we have mitigation. So how are we going to mitigate this? We're going to fix it. How are we going to do this? How are we going to prevent this from happening again? Well, we can use whitelisting and blacklisting. Specifically, we're talking about applications here. And so what is the difference between the two? Well, a whitelist, which is this first clipboard here, is a set of rules within a security appliance or a security product that defines what is allowed. So we're saying this is allowed to happen or to go through the appliance. These sites are allowed to be visited. This type of file is allowed to come through into our network. But if we use blacklisting, which is over here, it's going to go by a list of what is denied. All right, let's talk about these. If I was to set up or configure, we'll say configure a web filter. This is a filter that says what our users can access on the internet. Well, if I was to go with a whitelist, well, that would mean I would have to create a list of every website or group of websites, type of websites that's allowed. Because by default, everything is blocked. Whereas on the flip side, if I was to use a blacklist, then I would simply say what is denied because by default, everything is allowed. And that's the difference. 
And the thing is, as we're using these security products and configuring whitelisting and blacklisting, many of them have a quarantine feature. So for example, if you're using uh, the Cisco Firepower, uh, we'll say their advanced malware protection AMP, uh, one of the features is AMP will analyze files coming through the device to find out if they are malware or not. And it will block them if they are. If not, it'll allow them through. But it also has a feature to basically quarantine something. If you want it to, within the rule set, you can say, hey, go ahead and quarantine this file if it's malicious. That way, I can go in, I can grab this file here, and I can take it over and I can perform some malware analysis on the file because I'm curious to see what it does if I were to use something like Cuckoo, uh, which we talked about in a previous video, to perform the malware analysis. I'm really curious about it. And the thing is, maybe it was a false positive and it's not really malware. Well, then I would need to get that file because somebody in my environment needed it. And that is how we can use application whitelisting and blacklisting and how quarantine can be an effective tool. As we continue with our mitigation, well, oftentimes we need to make configuration changes because an attack happened. There was a compromise. Some type of malware or bad guy got into our systems. So I can take information about this incident, which we call indicators of compromise, IOCs, and I can take information. That could be like a specific email address, or it could be a domain name, or it could be some IP addresses, or it could be keywords uh, within an application. And I can take this information and I can use it in my security products like my firewalls, my IPS, my antivirus, my endpoint security, whatever I have out there, I can update the rules to watch for these things and block and send alerts when it sees them. So I can help prevent this same attack or similar ones from happening in the future. Then part of recovery. Well, how do we recover from this? We've, we've basically gone through so far and we've contained it. We mitigate it so it won't happen again, but I need to recover for it. Well, the first part's research. We've got to figure out what happened and then figure out if it can be cleaned up or do we need to do something else to restore. And when we're doing research, let's say, for example, uh, we had a ransomware infection, which is a common uh, occurrence in today's time. Well, I could jump out to nomoreransom.org, and that's a website that you can submit samples of the ransomware, meaning the file itself that caused the infection, or the ransom message that it provides you with on the screen. And this here, nomoreransom.org, will tell you if it's seen it before because it's kind of a database of ransomware that's on the internet. And if it has, it can provide you with the keys, if those are known, so you can recover and decrypt from this ransomware, and additional information as how to possibly clean up afterwards. And that's the idea. We need to research what happened so we can figure out how to remove it, how to recover, how to clean up after it, and get back into production. Now, as we continue our recovery efforts, we need to figure out, can we clean this up or do we need to go about it another way? Do I need to restore from backups or do I need to perform a clean operating system install on the device? Well, if it's a server like this here, we're probably running backups on it. And if you're not able to get it cleaned 100% or you don't have confidence that you've cleaned it, then it's time to restore from backup. Now, on a workstation over here, we probably don't run backups on it. And if you're not able to clean it, really the best thing to do is probably just perform a clean operating system install on this host here so that we know 100% sure that it's not infected anymore. And that is a way to recover if we can't get them clean. So we're restoring from backups or installing a clean operating system. And lastly, back into production. That is our primary goal. Once we've contained it, mitigated, recovered it, it's time to put our servers back into production so they can continue providing us the service that they were built to do. So as this guy down here says, coach, put me in. And once we do put something back into service, we need to pay special attention. We need extra eyes and monitors on that host to make sure nothing strange is happening uh, when it's back in production. So we want to keep an eye on it. So we make sure there's not some artifacts still on that host, even after it was cleaned. And that is the process of containment, mitigation, and recovery.
I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.